Tonight on EKB Evening News at 6. With suspensions lifted, attorneys continue to square off. Good evening, I'm Gary Sloan. And I'm Cindy Mae Johnson. Yesterday's announcement that the Social Security Administration had reversed the suspensions of disability payments to 900 people is affecting the legal battle surrounding that decision. Yesterday, the administration filed an answer to a motion seeking to block the suspension, saying, since Social Security had already changed its mind, the request is now moot. Today, a federal judge agreed with that argument and canceled a hearing on the motion. The administration also asked to dismiss the entire class action lawsuit brought on behalf of the 900 affected people. However, as Pikeville attorney Noah Friend explained today, attorneys for the 900 disagree. What we want to see from Social Security is I think this was a, an inexcusable attack by the administration on a really vulnerable population of people. Uh, they should have known the people that they were going after uh, had uh, mental problems, had physical problems, had medications that they needed to be on, and they really put those people at risk. And as we know, we unfortunately had a couple of suicides here, in addition to the countless people uh, that haven't been able to afford groceries and have had to rely on family and other help. Uh, so what we really want from Social Security at this point is we want to follow up and make sure that this uh, process going forward is as fair as possible, that it's transparent, and that they can't reverse course all of a sudden once the heat is off, so to speak, and sort of decide that they're going to do the same thing to people. Uh, so we're following up and seeing whether there is anything still that needs to be done in the courts and in the federal courts uh, to make sure there's some oversight in this process. A July 2nd telephone conference between the judge and attorneys will determine whether the case moves forward. Social Security initially suspended the benefits of 900 SSDI recipients and told 600 others who draw SSI that their benefits were in jeopardy. The benefits were reinstated after Congressman Hal Rogers met with Social Security officials and pointed out that the issue was a matter of life and death. Before the announcement of a reversal, three people who received the initial notices died, apparently victims of suicide. A former employee of the Mingo Logan Coal Company faces a federal charge of aiding and abetting frauds and swindles over allegations he steered company business to a supplier in exchange for kickbacks. 33-year-old Chadwick L. Lusk of Davin in Logan County was charged Tuesday in U.S. District Court in Charleston. Documents filed with the charges accused Lusk of conspiring with mine supplier CM Supply over a five-year period to pay Lusk for each crib block the coal company bought. This is not Lusk's first accusation of such a scheme. Last year, he was one of 10 people indicted last year in a similar scheme involving the Mountain Laurel Mining Complex. All 10 ultimately pleaded guilty. A federal judge has ruled that former state representative W. Keith Hall is protected by spousal privilege, allowing him to prevent his wife from testifying against him. U.S. District Judge Karen Caldwell made that ruling following a hearing in Lexington yesterday. Caldwell said the only way Stephanie Hall could be compelled to testify would be if she were engaged in criminal activity with her husband. However, because the government produced no evidence to that effect, anything said between the two would be protected under spousal privilege. Hall is accused of bribing former mine inspector Kelly Shortridge to overlook violations at Hall's mines. Shortridge pleaded guilty earlier this year and is expected to testify against Hall, who's scheduled to go on trial June 22nd. The Appalachia News Express is reporting that Pike Circuit Judge Stephen Combs will be the subject of a hearing of the State Judicial Conduct Commission later this month. The newspaper reported today it had obtained documents in the case saying the commission would hold a hearing in Lexington June 16th in order to decide whether or not to temporarily suspend Combs with pay pending the resolution of a misconduct case against him. Last month, the commission announced it was investigating allegations of misconduct against Combs, including that he made inappropriate comments to local officials and that he improperly presided over cases in which he had an interest. Combs has denied any wrongdoing. Well, coming up, both sides of the Tug River got a cleanup today. Mm -hmm. And the community continues to react to news that a beloved landmark will soon be moving. We'll be back in two minutes.
When visitors travel to downtown Pikeville, one of the first things they might notice is the train car on Hambly Boulevard. Plans to move the rail car out of Pikeville have stirred up some strong feelings. EKB News reporter Courtney Lovern spoke with several people for their reactions. The train car on Hambly Boulevard in Pikeville has made waves during the past week due to plans to relocate the old dining car to Lexington and give ownership to the company R.J. Corman. The railway car has been in the city for almost 50 years and locals voice their opinions against the train's removal. I remember being a little kid and touring the train car with my school class, so, you know, it's a shame it's moving. I think it's very disappointing to the city of Pikeville and to the county both. I think that they could have found a place for it. They could have took it to Bob Amos, anywhere to keep it here in Pipeful. But I just think it's a tradition to Pipeful. And I'd rather see it stay here instead of have them to take it out here because it's just something, it's old history. I think, I think it's important to remember, uh, you know, our roots and everything. And I, I certainly feel that the, the caboose is something that's been here for a while. And, uh, you know, just have a lot of memories there. And, you know, it's not like a what I call a happening hot spot in town, but it is something that's there and a lot of people know, a lot of people remember it, and I think a lot of people like for it to stay. Along with support for keeping the train in Pikeville, there were a few that think the removal will benefit the area. Uh, I think it's an exciting opportunity for Pikeville. Just with the train gone, more things will be added there, so it'll be cool to see what Mitch does with the land. I'm going to miss it because when you come downtown, you always see the train, so I'm used to it always being here, but I'm just really excited to what's going to be put there. I love the train. I think it's an awesome landmark, and I think we've had it for a long time, and it's it's been wonderful while it's been here. But I'm really excited to kind of see it go, and not in a bad way, but for it to live its life where it's supposed to be. I'm a little bit disappointed that it's leaving. Uh, anytime a piece of the railroading history of the area leaves the area, I am a little bit disappointed, but I'm also thrilled that it's getting a new lease on life. R.J. Corman's a, a, a great railroad company. Uh, really uh, values historic uh, uh, relics such as the such as the train car and really glad it's going to be used again. The move is scheduled to take place Saturday morning. Reporting for EKB Evening News at 6, I'm Courtney Lovern. Two states joined together today in an effort to get rid of tires that are becoming a problem in the Tug River near Buskirk and Matewan. EKB News reporter Shelby Steele attended today's tire pickup and brings us this report. Tires have become a problem along the Tug River. Today, two bordering counties joined together in an effort to clean up the river. The owner of the Hatfield and McCoy Airboat Tours was awarded a grant from multiple agencies in order to pay participants a bounty of $5 per tire. Kind of a radical thing I don't think's ever been done before, but I've managed to get grant in the amount of $6,500 total. I guess I should break that down so everybody's recognized. I got. Uh, 2500 from Turn This Town Around, 2500 with Co-Heritage, and 1500 from the County Commission. And I've put a bounty on the tires at $5 a tire will bring 1300 tires out of the river. There's a lot more than that in there, but it's a start. Many people from around the United States tour Pike and Mingo counties to visit the Hatfield and McCoy landmarks. Pike County Pride President Kent Stacy says we need to keep this area clean if we want more tourists to visit. We all the time hollering about tourism. If we don't clean up, we're not going to have tourism in this county. And also, I don't think that we're going to have business come in it unless we clean it up. Volunteer Jeff Davis adds that more people need to be involved in community cleanup efforts. We've done a good stretch of this river, and it's all good float. It's just uh, we just need to get some trash cleaned up, get some people caring about what it looks like. Kentucky State Representative Chris Harris says that this is the way all bordering states need to work. This is a tremendous effort between states, and this is what this is how states are supposed to cooperate. You know, um, the, the river connects West Virginia and Kentucky, uh, and you've got both states, both Mingo County and Pike County, as well as some people from Virginia here helping chipping in to try to clean up the environment, make it a little cleaner uh, and safer. Director of Pride Jimmy Dell Sanders says the litter needs to stop in both counties. The main thing is. Uh, Litter in, in Pike County and Eastern Kentucky and all over is, is a major problem for everybody. And uh, the main source of litter is, is the person, the John Q. Public. Everybody's got to get involved and put a stop to it. 
For EKB Evening News at 6, I'm Shelby Steele. 19 Pike County inmates participated in the Tug Fork cleanup as part of a work release program in an effort to make the area more attractive. The inmates helped with the tire pickup along the Kentucky-West Virginia border and picked up litter as well. Pike County Jailer Freddie Lewis says this helps the inmates learn responsibility and learn to give back to the community. Well, I think it's very important. I mean, number one, it, you know, <clears throat> these guys, they're classified inmates uh, through the Department of Corrections, which basically, you know, they're allowed to come out and do these types of work. Uh, also, it's a way for them to pay back to the community, I feel, you know. It's a way for them to pay back to the community and give back because, you know, unfortunately they are incarcerated, so therefore the taxpayers, we have to, you know, we take care of them, we keep them up, we feed them, and a good way for them to pay back is to come out and help the taxpayers by keeping our communities clean, our parks, uh, you know, our schools, working around our schools, and uh, and our roads, keeping our roads cleaned up. I'm, I'm a firm believer, you know, that uh, you, uh, you, you need to work for what you get. Now this isn't the only time the Pike County inmates have been out cleaning up the community. Lewis adds that since January, the jail has picked up over 11,000 bags of litter along the roadways, cleaned 275 abandoned cemeteries, and straightened up 12 schools and parks. That's good stuff. Good project. Coming up, our own Joe Kinzer will be in to talk about sports and the U Pike Youth Football Camp. But first, EKB Chief Meteorologist Lathan Hopkins will give us a peek of the weekend's weather. We'll be back in two minutes. I do it now. And. Uh, <laughs> We just received word, uh, we had a report just a few minutes ago from Courtney Levern about the train car. Uh, we understand that really that time frame is unclear as far as when the train car will be moved. So breaking news, the mm -hmm. train car delay, or move might be delayed. Yeah. It's very possible. It's a wait and see It's what an happens. interesting right. story is what it is. Stay tuned. Yeah. Oh, see how the great there. train caper. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> Uh, Weather-wise, another pretty nice day out there today. We did have a couple of showers pop up this afternoon. I know at my house, we had a heavier shower move through. You folks in Pikeville, nothing, nothing whatsoever. The Doppler radar showing, well, nothing going on locally. As a matter of fact, let's take you out and about. Let's stop first, downtown Pikeville. A beautiful, beautiful shot from the uh, weather cam high atop Pikeville Medical Center. Temperatures right now. 84 degrees. That is what it feels like outside. Humidity not being much of a factor today at 43%. Winds gusty at times from the west about 7 miles per hour. And notice the pressure is falling. We have a front on the way. And you can see the camera shaking there a little bit. That's from the wind. But uh, as the cold front moves closer, the uh, pressure will continue to drop. Maybe you are heading south on US 23 or 119. Jenkins, 80 degrees. Heading to the west, how about the Mountain Parkway, 84. And this is at Slade, all across eastern Kentucky. Beautiful conditions. Temperatures right now, as we mentioned, 84 in Pikeville, Prestonsburg, Inez. We have 85 in Paintsville and Salyersville. Right now, 83 in Hazard, as well as in Whitesburg. Officially, at the National Weather Service office in Jackson, we hit 84 degrees. The overnight low, 64 degrees. Close to where we should be this time of the year, which is 79 for the high, 60 for the low. No rain at the uh, National Weather Service office in Jackson. Still running about a oh, three and three quarter of an inch rainfall surplus for the year, but that continues to drop each and every day. Sunrise in the morning, if you will be out early, 609 sunset at 848. Satellite and radar composite. You'll see a couple of those showers moving from parts of uh, southeastern Kentucky into southwest Virginia a little bit earlier. Now we're just left with a few of those fair weather cumulus clouds. But I want you to notice to our north, right through here, north of Cincinnati, north of Evansville, right across uh, Indianapolis, this is the front. This one will continue to drop across our region tonight. Could produce a quick shower during the overnight hours or even first thing tomorrow morning. Once the front passes, it's going to cool temperatures down but not by much. Today we hit the mid 80s. Well, tomorrow, low 80s. So maybe two, three degrees. It's gonna be hard to even notice that much of a change. What you will notice though with the pollen count is that the pollen count will actually drop a little tomorrow, Saturday, 6.2.
out of a possible 12, which does put us in the moderate category, but by Sunday, the heat builds back in, the humidity will begin to climb, and the pollen count will do the same. 8.4 in the high category, dropping on Monday. Why is that? Well, that is because a cold front, another front, will be heading in. This one will bring a good chance of showers and storms as we head into Monday evening into Tuesday morning. Some of those may be on the stronger side, so that's what we'll watch. But the weekend, 30% chance of rain for tomorrow. Temperatures in the low 80s by Sunday. Just a pop-up shower possible. Temperatures in the mid-80s, maybe a few upper 80s as well. Is there any one day that is a better day for moving a rail car? Uh, Saturday or Sunday would be fine. Monday, not so much. Okay. So that's my input. I guess we'll find out. They're, they're not wanting my input. No, what they are we don't. Talking they about? never asked. No. <laughs> and by the way, yes, I did forget to mention Appalachian News Express and the Mingo Messenger. If you want to check out the forecast for tomorrow, for the rest of the weekend, and into early next week, just pick up a copy of either one of those. It's all there. It's all there. Thanks, Lathan. Well, Main Street Live returns to downtown Pikeville tonight. The bi-weekly event features live local music on Friday nights outside the East Kentucky Expo Center. Main Street Director Minta Trimble explains that this year's lineup features several themed nights, and tonight is Country Night. Well, tonight we have those guys with special guest Clark Sexton. Clark is a young guy, can sing anything, but tonight he's going to sing Country mm -hmm. Forest. Really, really talented. And uh, it's Red Solo Cup Nights. Red Solo Cup Night is inspired by a Toby Keith song and Trimble Explained will feature a special contest. <laughs> so we have our special large size Red Solo Cup. It's about uh, the size of a 33 gallon trash can. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Well, so now I understand. Yeah. Very much. And so it's going to be filled with solo cups. Okay. And we're going to give everyone the opportunity to guess how many is in that. Ah. And they get to win a little cash. Street Live gets underway tonight at 7 on the Billy Johnson stage. The event returns June 19th with a special Memories of Elvis night. I heard Elvis was lingering around the train car. Oh, okay. We'll be back with Joe Kinzer and Sports in two minutes. Joe Kinzer to Cincinnati Reds back in action. It's been a tough year so far for Brian Park, Price's Ball Club. Thanks a lot, Gary, and good evening, everyone. The Cincinnati Reds were back at it in Philadelphia last night, trying to avoid being swept by the Phillies. Let's pick it up. Top five, Reds down one. Brandon Phillips at the dish sends this one deep in the left field, just missing a homer. Skip Schumacher trots in from third, and the game is going to be tied at two. Next, bases loaded for Todd Frazier. Lunges out and hits a grounder to short. Throw comes to the plate. Carlos Ruiz blocks it and tags out the runner. Manager Brian Price storms out saying the catcher can't do that. Umps will now go over to the instant replay. The call is eventually overturned and the Reds are up 3-2. Top six, Reds up one. Billy Hamilton singles into center field and this will score one. The throw coming home. And the second run scores in the break, or the Reds have a two, five to two lead. Bottom nine, Arotis Chapman on the mound. Michael Franco, see ya. One down. Next comes up Cody Ash. Adios. And here's Freddie Galvis. Goodbye. The Reds win it six to four. Cincinnati will be back in action tonight at home as they'll host the San Diego Padres. Cincinnati has scratched starting pitcher Rizal Iglesias and has brought up John Moscott to start instead. Moscott had a 7-1 record and a 3.15 earned run average for Class AAA Louisville. To make room for Moscott, the Reds designated 37-year-old for assignments. UPI head football coach Al Holland Jr. and his staff has been conducting their football camp this past week at Hillard Howard Field. Michaela Colley files this report. You get to do drills and pass and catch, score touchdowns, and run the ball. The U-Pike football program and its staff is hosting a camp that started yesterday and will wrap up tomorrow. The campers will receive one-on-one -on -one instruction to help them in the improvement of their football abilities. 
it's just great for these young kids to be able to get out in the summertime, learn some new drills, to take home, to uh, be able to work uh, during the off season. Uh, you know, each kid's different, and each kid's going to take away something different from drill-wise to uh, some things that they can learn technique-wise. Um, you know, but you know, we try to in install some some little things with each and every one of them that uh, we want each one of them to walk out of here with a drill to take home that they haven't never worked before, uh, a different blocking scheme, a different footworks. Uh, but we want them to be able to take home and, and critique what we do compared to what their coach is teaching them to do in their systems to make them better. During the camp, it's the little details that are allowing the campers to find a place with a purpose while instilling hard work. You know, we get started each day and we teach them our stretch uh, flexibility because a lot of kids, you know, they take that for granted is stretching every single day. And then, you know, we get into some agility stuff to help them work with their hips and their feet and, and the little things that kids take for granted. You know, they all want to get out in the backyard and throw the football around, but we got to teach them some things to, to help them improve. Man. The university will hold a seven-on-seven -seven camp for high schoolers later on in the summer. For EKB Evening News at 6, I'm Michaela Colley. And thank you so much, Michaela. Pending approval from the Mingo County Board of Education, Mingo Central High School has named Garland Rabbit Thompson as the school's fourth head boys basketball coach. Thompson talks about his days at Tug Valley and his new opportunity as the coach of the Miners. In eight seasons at Tug Valley, Thompson compiled a record of 153 wins, 50 losses, and two state championships. You know, I've made a lot of friends. Uh, you know, I had an excellent staff. We've had a lot of success at, at Tug Valley. It, it was nothing but a positive experience. Uh, I wish whoever is the next coach all the best of luck. They've got a wealth of talent down there, and I'm sure whoever is the next head coach will be very successful there. And, and, you know, I was looking forward to the opportunity, and uh, Mingo Central gave me a chance, and I'm excited about it, excited for the kids. Uh, they've got beautiful facilities. You know, their team made it to the state tournament last year. Uh, a lot of enthusiasm seems like throughout the community. Uh, again, it's a great opportunity for me and my family, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. Well, it. It's a building block. You know, we'll start the basic ground floor. I've got to find a staff first. Uh, I've got a few people in mind. That will be the first thing. You know, I'm still not approved by the board yet, to be honest with you. So there's still a lot of things still up in the air, but. Again, you know, it is a process. It's, it's, it's just June. You don't have to be good in June. You just got to be good in March. The Miners will begin summer practice late next week. The Kentucky High School State Baseball Tournament continues this evening from Whitaker Bank Park in Lexington. Tonight, there will be two semifinal round games. Greenup County, 33-10, and, and winners of 15 straight, taking on 34-6 Highlands right now as we speak. At 8.30 in the nightcap, Scott, with a record of 23-4, will tangle with 34-7 West Jesmond. Moving over to West Virginia, congrats to the Chapmanville High School Tigers as they move on into tomorrow's Class 2A state championship game as they outslugged Oak Glen by the final score of 8-5. Turning our focus to high school girls softball, Jason Hurts, Johnson Central Golden Eagle squad, made school history last night by picking up the program's first ever state softball tournament win by defeating North Laurel 6-5. Johnson Central dropped both their games today, however, 1-0 to Warren East earlier this morning and this afternoon to Mercy 7-1. The Golden Eagles finished the season with a record of 27-11 and, and they will be one of the favorites to go back to Owensboro in 2016 as they return eight starters. And let's wrap up sports with horse racing. The eyes will be glued to the TV sets tomorrow evening as American Pharaoh attempts to become the first horse since affirmed in 1978 to capture the Triple Crown as the Belmont Stakes will move up to New York City. American Pharaoh is a three to five favorite. And gang, that's a wrap of sports. You can tell us. You got money on American Pharaoh? I'm going to put some money on American <laughs> Pharaoh. I think it's going to happen this time, gang. It'll be exciting. That's, that's a long time to go without a Triple Crown winner. Exactly. And we'll be right back. Well, Lathan, it looks like it's going to be a nice evening for all the activities in Pikeville. A lot of things going on downtown. Temperatures right now in the mid 80s, low to mid 80s. We will fall to 60 degrees overnight tonight, 83 for tomorrow with a 30% chance of rain. 
86 heating up on Sunday, and that trend will continue at least until the rain moves in on Monday. Then temperatures cool back down and the humidity will begin to drop. Okay. Thank it is you. going to be a great night downtown. It's a great night and weekend for the Reds. Yes, the Cincinnati Reds will be back in action tonight on Hit City USA. First pitch is 17. Okay, and right after this newscast, People can stick with us on EKB TV. We've got a graduation. Yes, at South Floyd High School, and we would like to congratulate the entire class of 2015 on their special achievements. Boy, do you remember that? It was a long time ago. Yeah, <laughs> too long ago. Uh, that will do it for tonight's EKB Evening News. Remember, you can get more local news anytime by listening to the radio stations of East Kentucky Broadcasting. You can follow EKB News and EKB TV on Facebook and Twitter. We're going to leave you tonight with a look back at the sunrise over the Towers Overlook at Brakes Interstate Park. Good night. Thanks for watching.